you know, I haven't even had a shower yet. I was going to put part seven at the, as a zone video, but I decided not to. I decided to put it at the end of the full story video. So the Batman who laughs, the full story. <laughs> Okay, so we are picking up with The Batman Who Laughs, which is a mini-series that's being written right now. It's, originally, I thought it was an ongoing series, but it's a mini-series. I don't really know how you'd make an ongoing series out of The Batman Who Laughs. And, you know, a character like him could only ever really be like a mini or a maxi-series, like six or 12 issues long. But this is a monthly series, which means that we have December and then January, February, March, April, and May is when it concludes, assuming that they stick with a six-issue format and there's no delays. Having said that, this character was crazy popular. And I knew, like, as soon as Batman Who Laughs dropped, like, as soon as Dark Knight's Metal happen and it was a version of Batman who became the Joker like I knew it was only ever a matter of time before we got a miniseries or something like that because people loved it like I mean you guys loved the idea of the Batman who laughs you guys are just like dude this is amazing but the other cool thing about this is that this is kind of like a return to form for Scott Snyder when it comes to Batman not to say his Justice League is bad or anything I love his Justice League I love the work that he's been doing so far but to me Scott Snyder is is best when he's on Batman because he just writes the character so well and so what this does is this initially picks up with a handful of guys who are basically smuggling things out of Gotham now this is the way Scott Snyder writes Batman Batman. For those of you guys who read his new 52 run, so Court of Owls, Night of Owls, Death of the Family, and Endgame, that a lot of it's just kind of like Batman being a detective while being a hero at the same time and kind of explaining to you what's happening as it's going on. And what we end up learning here is that among the various schemes that different criminals have in Gotham City, that one of them involves smuggling things out of, out of town and into other cities by way of using what are basically transport trucks. These giant flatbeds are designed for the purpose of moving houses. And you have, we have these old, you know, houses that are being moved out of Gotham City in order to build condos. But what's been going on here is that inside these flatbed trucks are like these small little segments, these small little compartments that can be used to house contraband. And no one's the wiser because as far as any cop looking at them is concerned, they're just moving houses out. They're just removing houses to make way for condos. And, and that's really the end of that. But where Batman kind of shows up here, it's, it's really kind of Batman par for the course, which is to say him going through and uh, and tracking these guys down, talking to Alfred on the other end and, and locating, you know, what's inside these compartments, what's basically here. Now where Batman takes these guys out almost right off the bat, he in turn analyzes the compartment, figures out where it's at, and then basically cracks it open. And when he does, there's basically a kind of stasis pod of sorts. And inside this pod, this, this casket is basically a version of himself. And that's when things really begin to pop off. And that's when it gets cool, when you start to get in the introspective stuff, because that's what Snyder does, right? Like Snyder's like, okay, so business as usual until it's not, until like things pop off and it starts to go crazy. And then you kind of have to figure out what in the world is going on. And so what ends up happening here is where he basically dresses up as like a morgue guy and then going through and analyzing his own body, Batman almost kind of has a, a, a little little bit of a crisis of self here, right? Like he looks at this whole thing and he says, okay, so this is basically me. And Alfred has the hardest time grasping this because remember, Alfred is looking at all this through the camera provided by Batman on his on his own body. And so it's not like Alfred can see Bruce Wayne and then the version of himself on the table. For Alfred, he's looking at Bruce Wayne on the table. And not only that, where they start going through and they start looking at this version of Bruce Wayne, they start seeing things where he's basically the opposite of the main DC universe Bruce, you know, the, the opposite of Bruce Wayne from Rebirth in the sense that this version of Bruce, uh, he had a happy life. And in a lot of ways, it almost kind of seems to be the life that, that Bruce Wayne envies. This version of Bruce Wayne had wrinkles on his eyes, which indicated laughter. He had a ring on his finger. He was married to Selina Kyle. He has a tattoo called May. That's the name that Bruce would have chosen had he and Selina Kyle got married and had a child. This is one of those things where you look at that and you say, this Bruce came from a perfect life, basically. He had the perfect life. That's somewhere along the line that he has all the same scars as the DC Rebirth Bruce Wayne, up to the point when he was when he basically had his back broken by Bane. And that seems to be the change in, in status quo, right? Like in the in the main DC universe, Bruce Wayne fought against Bane, right? Like, you know, Bane was this guy from Santa Prisca prison and he figured out Bruce Wayne's identity as Batman in like three months and basically instituted this, this kind of guerrilla warfare campaign. And that's when, when he br basically broke the back of, of Batman. And when he did, it was expected that Batman would be out of commission. Instead, Batman eventually took time to recover and he ultimately went back to being Batman again. In this alternate reality, that doesn't seem to have been the case. That Bruce's back was broken by Bane and then he just never went back to being Batman. He stayed as a person who was essentially hands off, which kind of begs the question, what happened to Jean-Paul Valley? Because in the time when Bruce Wayne's back was broken and the time he came back to being Batman, Jean-Paul Valley took up the mantle for himself. But, you know, this version of Bruce from this alternate reality seems to have taken up more of a humanitarian role. He worked on civil projects, different things like that. So he accepted his fate with his back broken and just kind of went forward accordingly. Somebody somewhere had basically killed him and we don't know who it was. And so again, it's it's kind of crazy because this is the life that Bruce always wanted, the life he never got. And to see it on, on the face of someone basically meant that 
the life he had was essentially taken away. In a lot of ways, it's a personal loss here. He found tried and true happiness and it was yanked away. Why? Like that's the question that he wants the answer to. And so from here, we switch over to Arkham Asylum and we have a couple guards running through and then we have Batman who basically appears here. And it's kind of funny because in this initial conversation between Bruce and Alfred, Bruce says, you know where we have to go. We have to go see him. And so then we switch back over to Arkham and then we essentially have like Batman go on a warpath and start killing all these guards. He's decked in guns. He's got all kinds of arms and armament. The guy is loaded for bear. And this is something that we don't normally see. Like you never see Batman really use guns. You do like once in a blue moon. But aside from the 1940s, late 1930s, early 1940s, during the golden age, when Batman did actually kill people, they usually use more for like fear tactics. It's to show how extreme Batman is at the time, uh, as opposed to the fact that he would actually use it on a person. But going through and killing every last one of these guards, these guys are innocents. You know, these guys are, are not people who are inherently vindictive. Like they're not people who are bad people. They're people with their own lives, their own family, so on and so forth. So this is a merciless version of Batman. He kills a member of his own rogues gallery. He's going through and it's literally a one man army. From there, he basically breaks into one of the cells and frees the Joker. At least it seems like he's freeing the Joker. Now it's kind of interesting because from the Joker's perspective, it really is the arrival of Bruce Wayne and Bruce Wayne snapped, right? And as we know from the killing joke, it's like the one thing the Joker always wanted to show Batman that all it takes is one bad day to essentially kind of snap, to break and to become some sort of villain. And that's the Joker's mantra. But on the other side of that coin, it's the thing the Joker doesn't want the most, that the Joker needs Batman. He has to have him there. Without Batman, Joker's incomplete. He has no real purpose. Batman is the yin to Joker's yang. And so where he kind of taunts him for a second, or at least talks to him and says, you know, are you here to kill me? You know, he simply just says no. And instead, the Batman who laughs shows up. And it's just like, wow dude as soon as i saw this i was like holy cow you know and it's crazy because because joker starts begging for his life and that's uh, that's that's very uncharacteristic of the joker right like the joker never begs for his life the joker would probably he would just start laughing maniacally you know because well this is the end of the joker this is how it ends almost as if it was kind of like some ironic sad tale that the joker always imagined that batman would be the one to kill him and instead it ends up being the batman who laughs and that's one thing to bear in mind is that the joker knows who the batman who laughs is he knows who he's about but before he even has a chance to respond the Batman who laughs smashes him in the head with a with a hatchet and kills the Joker and it's just like wow and so switching over to Batman basically following up on the death of the Joker, this is when we end up learning it wasn't actually the Joker. Now, in reality, this is an important thing. In reality, if you're new to comic books, this would seem like, well, that's dumb. But in truth, like this, this is the nature of the Joker, right? Like this is not something Scott Snyder's pulling out of his backside. He's not taking the cheap way out. That the Joker, if he if he senses that his end is coming, if he senses that somebody, anybody besides Batman is going to kill him, what he'll do is he'll take one of his dummies and he'll switch them out. We've seen him do that multiple times over the years. So again, that's par for the course. It's like the coin of Two-Face. It's like the gun of Victor Freeze. It's just part of the Joker's character. It's part of what he does. So that's a very important thing to understand because it'll shift your perspective on why this happened and why it played out the way it did. Again, it's not Scott Snyder taking the easy way out. It's just the nature of what the Joker does constantly. And so where Batman ends up traveling back to the Batcave, what he ends up doing here is, is basically speaking with Alfred and saying, you need to open the door to the waterway. And when, and when Alfred's response is one of protest, Batman's response is, you have to do this. And that's when we end up realizing that inside the waterway is the actual Joker himself. Now, now, there's a reason why this happens. So we need to kind of jump all the way back to the new 52, really going forward from like death of the family to end game. And the reason why is because when it comes to Scott Snyder's storytelling of Batman, it all feeds in, right? Like Scott Snyder kind of goes on the assumption that you're familiar with his Batman story, his Batman run at the start of new 52 in order to understand what's going on now. So to kind of explain that, um, when the new 52 first kicked off, there was a single issue, like a, like an annual or like a special or something like that from detective comics that featured the Joker. And then we didn't, we didn't hear from him for like two years. And it wasn't until death of the family when the Joker returns that you basically end up realizing the Joker's been doing a lot of things behind the scenes. The Joker's been removing his face and he basically has it kind of sewn back on again. He, he institutes like the systematic destruction of the Batman family. He goes through and he wages kind of a one-man war against Batman which culminates in Endgame. You learn things like the Joker is essentially immortal by consuming Dionysium, different things like that. But one of the things that Snyder establishes is that in the early days of Bruce's career as Batman, between the time when he was full on Batman and the time that the, the Batcave was formed, that what had happened was he had basically faced off against the Joker. You know, things had kind of gone awry. The Joker seemed to have been defeated, but the Joker had basically stowed away and followed Batman to the Batcave and figured out where Batman resided. And so again, it was it was kind of interesting because that fed into death of the family. When the Bat family realizes this, they realize the Jokers always know where they operated out of. And at any point in time, their identities could have been leaked. At any point in time, their personal lives could have been destroyed. And Batman didn't tell anyone. It was a betrayal of the Bat family. It was like the big betrayal that Batman hid the fact that the Joker knows where the Batcave is. 
And so that's why this is significant here is because it's like the common meeting ground. It's the one place Batman would expect the Joker to show up if the Joker believed his life was in danger and the Joker was looking for some measure of safe haven. And that's what Batman tells him, you're safe here. And, and the Joker says, I don't want to be safe. Pulls a gun on Batman and hits Joker in the heart. And that's exactly what the Joker was aiming for. And what ends up happening here is the worst fear of Batman, exactly as it played out with the Batman who laughs. That with the Joker dying, the toxin in his chest begins to leak out to infect the next person that killed him to turn them into the Joker. And when that happens, it infects Batman. And when it infects Batman, he turns into the Batman who laughs. And when the question is asked, why did Joker do this? The Joker said, because you can't stop him unless you become him. Okay, so we are continuing the Batman Who Laughs miniseries, and uh, yeah, dude, okay, I'm, I'll am i be honest, man, like, like it's like the same thing I said in the first in the first issue, like, this is so cool, and Jock is the one who, okay, so Jock's the one doing the art. Those of you guys who don't know, I'm pretty sure Jock was the one who did the art for uh, Witches, and if you guys never read Scott Snyder's Witches, you are seriously missing out. Dude, Scott Snyder's Witches is ridiculously good. I can't wait to get into Witches 2, but uh, it's 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 pretty wild. Anyway, so uh, so one of the things to pick up on here, and, and kind of rehash, because it's been a little while, been a few weeks since we did the first one and we do have some catching up to do uh because i mean it is january so it's a time of year where we just kind of lay back and just do like three videos a week or something like that then we start picking things back up again so we, once we get into like february and march with this whole idea of the batman who laughs the batman who laughs was like the most popular character to come out of dark knight's metal right like i think we can all agree on that but the batman who laughs was just resoundingly popular because it was the answer to the question what would happen if batman became the joker and the idea behind this is that the batman who laughs had always just kind of been in the background following dark knight's metal he was never actually defeated and it wasn't really until recently until this mini series that we actually have him doing things he was kind of in the beginning of, of immortal men a little bit but he was more in the beginning of immortal men for the purpose of like drawing in readership than actually doing anything worthwhile but the long and short of what we've seen so far just in the first uh, really the first and second issue so far is that the batman who laughs has a plan we just don't know exactly what it is but remember the entire basis behind how the batman who laughs became what he was was when the joker had essentially been killed and then released a kind of joker toxin that infected bruce wayne and turned him into the joker which turned him into the batman who laughs and so the idea is that when joker kind of appears to bruce wayne at the end of the first issue and then offs himself then it's essentially like okay the joker's like you're the only one who can defeat the batman who laughs you have to become me in order to beat him and then joker basically tries to off himself in an effort to like spread the toxin out the difference here is that it doesn't happen right off the bat because of the fact that that bruce wayne is aware of who the batman who laughs is and the origin story of his character he's trying to like stem the flow and so what's basically going on here is bruce is kind of transforming but trying to keep it at bay while at the same time the joker's being worked on if the joker dies then that's when the toxin really gets released and there's no coming back but in this instance what bruce wayne has been doing is literally pumping himself with every kind of joker toxin they have but that's one of the important things to bear in mind here is that the toxin within the joker's heart is so potent that it can't really be stopped all the other versions of the joker toxin that exist out there those have antidotes right like that's what bruce wayne's been using over the years is using those antidotes to those versions of the joker toxin synthesizing an antidote if the if the toxin is new and then using it to cure people people this is a perfect strain it's it's a perfect and pure strain and so there is no antidote for it there's no conceivable way to overcome it and so the best that bruce can do is stave it off and so while that's happening what he's trying to do here is understand what the batman who laughs is trying to do and so in the midst of all this while all that's going on what we end up having is some guy who's driving and suddenly like a version of bruce wayne lands on top of his car now this brings in commissioner gordon and it brings in what appears to be harvey bullock now with commissioner gordon he's kind of working on the other half of this case the first part of the case kind of the front side is the Batman who laughs his back, what's his plan? The backside is all these different versions of Bruce Wayne from what are basically what seem to be like the dark multiverse are popping up. Now, that's kind of the, the caveat here is initially it seemed to be dark multiverse versions of Bruce Wayne. This does not appear to be true. Instead, what it seems to be are versions of Bruce from across the multiverse, not versions of Bruce Wayne from the dark multiverse. And the reason why is because with that multiverse itself, it was basically full of what like, like worst case scenarios. What if Superman became a bad guy and killed everybody on Earth? What if Batman became the Joker? Joker and then became an evil version of Batman. Like, that's the kind of thing you see in the Dark Multiverse. This version of Bruce, like the other version who had died and the other versions that have appeared off panel that have been discovered by Commissioner Gordon are good versions of Bruce. This one in particular was actually mayor of Gotham City. The problem with this is that while all that happens, one of the rookies basically walks up to, to Harvey Bullock, starts talking to him, and Harvey Bullock starts freaking out. And that's when we end up learning this is actually Bruce Wayne with the Joker toxin. And that's what's so crazy about this is Bruce is walking a knife's edge right now. At any moment, he could fall over. He could literally flip over 
over to the other side and become the Joker. He's doing the best he can to, to kind of hold it together, but there's a limit to all this. The other half, and this is this is one of the cool things about Scott Snyder writing, is Bruce reveals something that we didn't really know before. And so one of the things he does here is he draws what's basically called the last laugh. And the idea was that if Gotham City were ever attacked, which is to say if it was like a chemical weapon or if there was some kind of toxin that was released across the city or whatever it is, but the city itself just sort of fell into absolute madness, that there were all these tunnels that had been designed over the years that would basically allow for, for fast travel of like food and supplies and means by which the city could essentially be fixed. But what Bruce Wayne has been working on is his own version of Last Laugh. Because of the fact that the Joker toxin is so so powerful and presumably coming out of the events of Batman Endgame, one of the things that Bruce Wayne devised is that there had to be a means by which the city could be cured. He could literally pump an antidote into the entire city itself and cure everyone. And so by working on that, one of the things he says is that this is a, a system by which Gotham can be saved, but it's also a system by which Gotham can be destroyed. And the initial response of Commissioner Gordon is, well, then what's the huge concern here? And the response of Bruce Wayne is to say that you can only access it using DNA. And that's when we pick up with the Batman who laughs. And that's what's so great about this is because the Batman who laughs is an evil version of Bruce. He essentially had all the same experiences as Bruce Wayne up until the point when the Joker died and he was hit with the toxin and then went crazy. And so because he thinks, he feels, he functions in the exact same way as Bruce Wayne in the main DC universe, he would do the exact same things Bruce would, which means he's he's aware of the exact same things Bruce is. And so that's when really Snyder kind of tells us indirectly that all these things that Bruce Wayne's doing in the main DC universe, the Batman Who Laughs did in his universe. And so with that happening, with that in mind, Batman Who Laughs shows up at Wayne Manor, which is the only access point to this last laugh uh, tunnel that Bruce Wayne's been building, and then in turn basically begins to access it. Now, the only real guardian here is a guy named Bill. And the initial inclination is like, how does Bill not know this is Bruce Wayne? Only for us to find out that Bill's blind. And so it's kind of a cool thing because what this would do is it would actually allow Bruce Wayne to access this aspect of Wayne Tower and for Bill to never really know Bruce Wayne's face or at least to never really know that it was actually him. Now, the fact that Bill refers to him as Mr. Wayne indicates that Bill knows exactly who Bruce Wayne is and the Batman who last makes his way in there. And when he does, we see an aspect of his character we don't normally see. When it comes to this version of Bruce and when we saw him in Dark Knight's Metal, he was really more of like the second in command. He was a guy who was running alongside Barbados. But when you throw him into the story, what it does is it shows he's just as, as capable as we would expect. It's all the formidable uh, formidable abilities of Bruce Wayne combined with the insanity of the Joker, which basically makes for him going through and killing every single member of Wayne security inside this section of Wayne Tower with no limits whatsoever. One of the other cool things here, and to really kind of underscore the fact that he and Bruce think so much alike, is that once all these guys are dead, he counts down and three, two, one, bam, enters Batman. And that's kind of the cool thing here is because what it means and what it really shows here is that Bruce Wayne fighting this evil version of himself that it really seems to be an even match. And in fact, as this fight unfolds, Bruce comments on it proper that he says, well, I'm, I'm stronger, but I'm not faster. And so because of the fact that he's able to fight so capably, what this means is he can overcome me. Because of the fact that he knows exactly how I function, he knows the weaknesses. He knows what kind of weapons he needs in order to overcome my various suits of armor and the kind of defense mechanisms that I employ. And it's kind of a funny thing here because Bruce gets the upper hand and on the Batman Who Laughs, and when Bruce kind of basically says, like, your whole plan stops here, the response of Batman Who Laughs is, what makes you think this is not part of my plan? And that's the cool, that, that's what I love so much about his character, is it, Scott Snyder writes him in such a way that you have to assume everything that happens, happens according to the will of the Batman Who Laughs, that if he's defeated, it's because he wanted to be defeated, because he wanted to be taken to a particular location, and he knew he would be taken to that location if he was defeated, because he knows how Batman works. And so you have to assume that he knows everything that's going to happen, or at the very least, has planned it all out ahead of time. And this all really comes to a head when Bruce Wayne is shot. And this is cool because what Batman Who Laughs does is he says, there's basically this guy out there, this version of Bruce Wayne who's out there, he's called the Grim Knight. He's basically Batman as the Punisher. That this version of Bruce Wayne is far more extreme. And the way he came into existence was by virtue of the fact that when Joe Chill shot Thomas and Martha, Bruce Wayne picked up a gun and shot Joe Chill. The implication seems to be that Joe Chill shot Thomas and Martha and then dropped the gun out of perhaps panic or fear, or whatever the case was, and ran. And in that moment, Bruce Wayne picked the gun up and shot Joe Chill. And that set him on the path of killing every criminal he finds. And so what Batman Who Last does is kind of reveal everything to Bruce and say, you built this entire place in order to ensure that Gotham could be saved in the event of an emergency by pumping out some antidote. I'm going to use this as a means to destroy the city. And the response of Bruce is, well, you can't do that because the building can only really be used in that regard if it's empty. And the response of Batman Who Last is, I know. And all these safeguards that you have in place have all been dismantled by the Grim Knight. He's done it all over the 
over the last couple days. So I'm going to destroy this building and I'm going to destroy your ability to basically save the city of Gotham. In this moment, there's nothing that can be done. There's nothing Bruce Wayne can do. The best he can do is escape. He grabs Bill. He uses one of those little grappling hooks. They escape the they escape Wayne Tower and the entire building comes crashing down around them. And so what this means is the means by which Gotham can be saved based on whatever plan the Batman who laughs has is gone. There's no real way to believe that it can be done in any real measure of time because you have to assume that whatever plan it is the Batman who laughs has, whatever plan he has uh, has based is going to be predicated on what Bruce Wayne would most likely do. So again, overcoming the odds by knowing how his enemy functions. And so with Bruce Wayne returning back to, uh, to Wayne Manor and running up to Alfred, it's wake the Joker up. You have to wake him up. Now, what we end up realizing here is Joker's been awake the entire time. He's been listening to the discussions of Bruce and Alfred and where he's been kind of laughing and they've been assuming it's a reaction. In reality, he's laughing at the futility of their choices. He's laughing at the futility of their efforts to try to stop the Batman who laughs because the response of, uh, you know, really with Bruce here, the idea is you have to know the answer. You have to know what it is that the Batman who laughs wants. He's basically you from an alternate reality. Only you really seem to be the one that knows how his mind works. Tell me what he's going to do. And the response of the Joker is, I don't know what he's going to do. There's only one person out there in the entire world who knows exactly what it is that Batman who laughs is going to do. And that person is none other than James Gordon Jr., the son of Commissioner Gordon and the guy who's basically nuts. Okay, so we are uploading this kind of late um, because I just got back from Disney World. <laughs> uh, had an amazing trip. It was awesome. I'll probably have a video about it on my vlogging channel. Uh, but we are covering The Batman Who Laughs Part 3. And in the last video, we basically picked up with essentially the return of James Gordon Jr. Now, James Gordon Jr. is the son of Commissioner Gordon, of James Gordon, and of course the brother of Barbara Gordon, Batgirl. But the cool thing about James Gordon Jr. is that he's... Imagine the Joker if he was rational, which I know kind of takes away from the premise of like a psychopath. But when it comes to James Gordon Jr., he's one of these guys where all he did was like think and plan ways to like wipe out people, destroy things, cause as much like, you know, pandemonium and chaos as he possibly could. And so because of that, of course, he was basically in, in prison. And of course, he was put in a program where it was basically a, a drug that was produced by Wayne Pharmaceuticals that could essentially cure a person who was a psychopath. And if I remember correctly from Batman Eternal and from Forever Evil, the idea was to test the drug on on James Gordon Jr. to see if it would work on like the Joker or somebody like that. So he was kind of a test subject more or less. But for the most part, it's been working. Like he takes two shots a day, like tests his blood, you know, to make sure that everything's still in effect and so on and so forth. He gets kind of nuts in terms of how he how he lives his life. But it, it's super, super strict to make sure he doesn't go back to doing what he was doing before. But the idea behind this is, you know, for those of you guys who are catching up, the idea behind this was that the Joker, when he was taken prisoner by Batman or really kind of brought in by Batman and then so on, everything kind of unfolded, is that James Gordon Jr. is the key to stopping the Batman who last and we didn't really know how far this key extended right like we didn't really know what doors it unlocked but that's essentially what this kind of does when you have james gordon meeting with his son it's really kind of scott snyder giving us this refresher and saying here's what james has been doing but then of course the group is met with the arrival of batman and this is when things get kind of cool because what bruce says on a, on a normal circumstance when bruce wayne approaches someone like this he wants them for a particular purpose but he wants to make sure that things stay on the up and up when he approaches james gordon jr what he says is i don't want the version that's doing what he's supposed to do like i don't want the one who's a good guy i want the murderer like i want the murderer the killer the, the crazy psychopath that's the version that i want and the whole idea behind this is as batman explains is that the batman who laughs is implementing a plan to essentially like destroy gotham now we don't know exactly what this plan is in its entirety we just know like the batman who laughs wants to unleash pandemonium and, and chaos and the way the snyder plays this out is it looks like it'll be something that's far more extreme than like batman endgame for those of you guys who never read batman endgame what we ended up finding out was the joker had this plan to essentially release joker toxin across the entire city of Gotham and to send the city into like like mass hysteria and into like you know chaos and and panic and so on and so forth and it worked he actually did it like it was it was kind of nuts the way it all played out but of course with Batman using the last laugh plan which was essentially using like the tunnels of Gotham to uh, essentially pump out like a, a cure to the Joker toxin where all that's kind of out the window now the idea is to know what the joke what the Batman who last plan is going to be and because James Gordon Jr. is a legitimate psychopath who spent a majority of his life just like analyzing and trying to find ways to destroy things he's the best person to go to because right now they can't really they can't get answers from the joker and so it's kind of cool because what this is is an act of desperation while james gordon jr is a psychopath he's not exactly like the batman who laughs the batman who laughs is a combination of the joker and batman it's an answer to the question what would happen if batman became the joker and so the best person to go to 
is the Joker. But the Joker's not spilling the beans. He's not giving any real answer. And the only answer he did give is go find James Gordon Jr. He's the answer you're looking for. And so that's literally why Batman's following these breadcrumbs and following these directions is because he doesn't really have a choice here. It's kind of funny because James Gordon Jr. does not want to do any of this stuff. James Gordon Jr. is like, I don't want to do this. Like, I do not want to jump into this scenario again. I don't want to go back to being that version of myself. So he's very much against the idea, which really kind of ties Batman's hands. And so when they try to reason with him and they say like, put down the scanner and, and like talk to us, he says like, I'm not the one with this red dot, meaning somebody's targeting them. And that's whenever, when, when like all hell starts to break loose, because of course the group is met by the arrival of what's basically Punisher Batman. And this is cool because Punisher Batman and like Batman himself actually face off against each other. It's basically a guy who's shooting to kill versus a guy who's not. And they're able to like dodge the attacks of each other. So for the most part, it's, it's a stalemate in so far as one of them kind of gets the upper hand, you know, Batman kind of gets the upper hand on Punisher Batman, but not really. And the reason why is because where Punisher Batman is kind of caught unawares with like a grappling hook and basically kind of left dangling over, over a bridge and whatnot, uh, you end up having him basically like bring in all these different vehicles and so on, and then say like, there's a jet flying above us. And if you do not give me James Gordon, I'm going to destroy the jet. I'm going to destroy one of its, one of its, uh, one of its engines. And this is cool because what this does is it again, hints at the idea and really kind of points at the idea of how capable this evil alternate reality version of Batman is that in his universe, there are no villains. There's no Joker, no Scarecrow, no Penguin, no Two-Face, no nothing. He's killed them all that he has basically uh, gone through and like essentially like controls the entire city of Gotham, right? Even hits it like, you know, hints home at what he calls the colony. And so that's really kind of Scott Snyder basically bringing in the idea of like Tom King and, and James Tinian's Batman run or Batman Detective Comics run when you have the colony, right? Like this organization that essentially uh, kind of took over kind of a paramilitary group, the father of Batwoman who took over, wanted to take over Gotham City and then like basically weaponized Batman's technology to essentially control the city of Gotham. And then alternate reality, this Punisher Batman's done that. And so being that capable, he's basically began colonizing Gotham City in like the main DC universe by basically saying like, I know everything that's going on everywhere. Or at least, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I am. And so him basically saying like, if you don't do what I tell you to, then I'm going to take out this plane. 72 people are going to die. 41 of them are Gothamites. I'm going to kill them all. All you have to do is give me Commissioner Gordon and it all goes away. And where, where, where Gordon is kind of like, where he believes that it's his son that he's talking about, the response of Batman is, it's not the son, it's you. And he literally knocks out Commissioner Gordon and hands him over to like Punisher Batman. And the idea behind this, at least, you know, in, in terms of why this is being done is Batman says that when it came to like the whole last laugh device that he had, the device that would serve the purpose of like allowing a, a cure to be implemented throughout the city of Gotham required like a two point activation. It required Batman and someone he trusted, the only, the only other person he really trusts being Commissioner Gordon. Now, switching over to the Iceberg Lounge to uh, to, to Penguin, it's kind of cool here because of course the Batman who laughs basically busts in and starts torching the place, literally using the various weapons and and, and gimmicks of the Joker, I'm sorry, of, uh, of Penguin to start tearing everything up and start letting everything, you know, setting everything on fire. Now, some of the gimmicks that really seem to be brought here by Batman Who Laughs seem to be gimmicks from his own universe, which is to say, like one of the, the I guess, you know, an umbrella of the penguin that can shoot alcohol, which in turn, if given a flame, can set everything on fire. Just small little things like that that are that are really interesting and, and really, really smart for him to use in this scenario by literally taking out all the forces of Penguin and then bringing in another version of Bruce Wayne. And in this alternate reality version of Bruce, this is a version that actually tried to reason with the penguin. They tried to like work alongside the penguin and actually became a criminal lord himself and then rose to power and gained more power than the penguin did and then the tables turned so that when penguin was basically losing all of his clout all of his power and all of his money he tried to reason with this version of bruce but was always pushed out so this version of bruce wayne is basically a mob boss and it's kind of cool to see like he's dark he's sinister and it's, it's interesting to see that happen because of course the batman who laughs kills that version of bruce and then tells tells penguin if what you're looking for is the person who basically set all this in motion a person who seems to be like skewing your dice to where it's taking away the effect of like the house rigging the games and so on and so forth, then go talk to one of your guys named Matches Malone. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Matches Malone is the criminal underworld identity of Bruce Wayne. He uses the name Matches Malone to infiltrate the criminal underworld so no one really knows that he's actually Bruce Wayne. It's a long-standing secret identity. It's one of those, those little Easter eggs and hallmarks that fans love seeing brought up all over the place. But it's a cool little thing here because what Batman Who Laughs does is basically send Penguin on the trail of Matches Malone. Now, that probably won't come to fruition for quite some time. But what it does mean is that somewhere later on around the corner, presumably when Scott Snyder starts writing into other Batman stories and so on, the Penguin will start looking for Matches Malone, all the while totally unaware of the fact that he's basically tracking down Batman and just not knowing it. So it's kind of cool here, because what ends up happening is that when Batman basically gets James Gordon Jr. back to the waterways and says, hey, look, I need you to look at everything here and use your psychopathic, intelligent mind to figure out what's the best way to spread some toxin around Gotham and like destroy the entire city, James Gordon Jr. initially begins to kind of bend and, and say, okay, but then 
then he, he asks a question. He says, like, tell me one thing. Did Joker get to you? Did the Joker get to you and Joker infect you? Because if he did, that's the key to the plan. There's no, there's nothing I can really do here. If anything, I'm like a stopgap measure. You know, I can't really do a whole lot of things here. Like, there's there's not a whole lot that I can that I can offer in this scenario. I mean, he does what he can, but like that's really it. But in the middle of it all, suddenly like Alfred pops up. The Bat Cave has basically been trashed. The Joker's literally like he's got his heart, like his chest is open. He's got his heart sitting there. He's been writing ha 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 in blood all over the place. Like it's absolutely bonkers. And so so what ends up happening is like when the question is asked by James Gordon Jr., what do we do next? Batman says we do the only thing we can do. The one thing that we should have been doing the entire time. The one thing the Joker told me to do at the beginning of all this. The one thing everybody's been telling me all this time. The one thing that I was supposed to do this whole time and never really wanted to do in the first place. And so what ends up happening here is that when Alfred finally makes his way back to the Bat Cave and then finding out that he cannot access the the proper location and then has to go to like one of the exterior entrances, when he gets down there, we end up finding out that what Batman's done is removed all the toxin uh, all the toxin blocks from his body and totally given in to like the Joker serum. This is the only plan that I have. I have to become the Batman who laughs. I have to become this version of the character in order to be able to defeat him. Crazy. Okay, so I just saw Best Man. Like, I was just watching Best Man with Mariah. That movie's really good. We're actually getting ready to watch the second one, but I have to record this audio. I recorded it the first time, and then it turns out I recorded it through the, the microphone on my on my laptop, on my Mac Pro, and so I screwed it up. Anyway, okay, so getting into... Um, Batman, the, the Grim Knight. This is actually kind of interesting because Snyder usually plays these things pretty close to the vest and it's kind of a change of pace to introduce like a one shot. I mean, he did that with like the origins of the, the various, you know, villains from Dark Knight's Metal. So I guess it kind of makes sense to keep the trend going. But before that, there weren't really any one shots, right? Like Court of Owls, Night of Owls, Endgame, Death of the Family. It was all kind of contained in like the particular run. So this is kind of a cool maneuver here and I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes. But what this does is it initially picks up with basically Punisher Batman. I'm calling a, a calling him Punisher Batman because that's basically what he is. But the cool thing about this is that this initially picks up with like the death of Bruce Wayne's family. Now, of course, this is uh, kind of a hallmark of the character. It's like Krypton exploding for Superman. And the idea is that under normal circumstances in the main DC universe, Bruce Wayne was just kind of left there, right? Like Joe Chill pulled the trigger, killed his parents and then ran. And that was kind of the end of that. And then of course it was Bruce Wayne basically saying like, I'm going to swear vengeance. So this never has to happen on anybody else again or anything along those lines. But in this instance, this is not what happens. Instead, Bruce basically experiences like this rush of anger and fear and in doing so picks up the gun turns it on joe chill and shoots him now this is kind of a cool thing because what this does is it sends him down the pathway of becoming this dark and evil version of batman now one of the important things to bear in mind here is how this kind of feeds into like the no kill rule right like it's not really a hard and fast rule it's not like it was established in a particular comic that batman will kill no more it was just kind of a gradual series of events that led to a sort of editorial decision made by dc that batman won't use guns anymore but the overall gist in terms of why this exists and how it was kind of explained with regards to the Batman mythos was twofold. The first is that guns are so final. You pull a gun and you shoot someone, there's no undoing that, right? Like you can't come back from that, you can't undo it, that's Batman's perception. But at the same time, the other reason why Batman really kind of steers away from guns is because guns kind of hold a particularly iconic role in his life because that's what killed his parents. And so the idea is to always basically stay away from that concept and then of course use the role as Batman to try to save as many people as possible. But following this whole thing with his, with his parents basically dying and him shooting Joe chill what it does is it almost kind of mirrors batman year one by frank miller which is a retelling of his origin in the post-crisis landscape and so what you have here where he's like breaking you know breaking bricks and where he's like kicking a tree and different things like that those are all basically like homages to to batman year one those are scenes from that comic but the kind of difference here is that where all that training was done by batman traveling the world learning all these different forms of martial arts learning espionage and stealth and all that kind of stuff training with like ninja clans and different things like that where all that was geared towards using all that for the purpose of instilling fear and then using that fear to prevent a or to eliminate a criminal element in Gotham, this version of Batman is using it to kill. Now, again, one of the big ways that they kind of pay homage to the old Batman origin story is that in that old story, you had like a bat that flew through the window, right? You know, it's kind of one of those hallmark moments of Batman's origin stories. A bat flies through the window and then it crashes and then Bruce looks at it and says, yes, father, you know, I will become fear. I will become Batman. The same thing kind of happens here, except Bruce Wayne shoots it and says, that's the idea. I'll become fear. I'll basically become a bat in order to eliminate the criminal element in Gotham. And one of the first things he does is he goes to like this mob house and basically kills everyone, right? Like he literally like kicks over this, this fire stand, uh, this fire pit, and then like burns the whole place down and like burns all these people alive. It's cutthroat.
Ravenbrook. And so what this does is it really kind of skips forward a little bit. But one of the things that the Grim Knight says is that there's really no version of the Joker in the universe he comes from. But the reason why is because in the early days of his criminal element, he killed the Joker at Ace Chemical. That in the early days, Batman essentially took out like the Red Hood who would become the Joker. He took out Killer Croc. He took out the Penguin. All these different guys. So he took out all these different criminals right in the very, very early days. And what this has done, or at least what it did, is it kind of turned him into an extreme vigilante that was being tracked down by the Gotham City Police Department. But in this instance where he's a, he's a pure, like a pure died in the wool killer, it's one of these things where like the, the, the only real cons uh, constant concept here is the moral incorruptibility of Commissioner Gordon. That it seems like in, in every single universe that a Commissioner Gordon's in, he al he's always a good guy. He always has like this moral compass. It's one thing you can't betray. You know, you don't kill people without, without any kind of recourse or anything like that. But at the same time, it's actually a pretty cool scenario because the great thing about the Punisher Batman, the, the great thing about the fact that he kind of takes a law into his own hands and kills all these criminals is he's really just kind of saying, hey, look, the justice system had the opportunity to ensure these guys wouldn't be released again. But because the nature of the justice system is all about giving second chances, what it does is it basically says, hey, look, yes, you're criminals. We're going to give you opportunities to continue committing crime. Batman's Batman's stance is I'm taking those opportunities away. The criminal justice system is basically a means by which you can escape your guilt and then in turn do the exact same thing over again. And there'll always be a lawyer somewhere to get you off. They're not doing any good for anybody. And so it's a, it's a pretty cool concept here and it actually works exceedingly well. And so what you literally have is this funny scenario where Commissioner Gordon tries to draw Batman out. And this is one of the cool things about this. He tries to draw Batman out and in doing so, quote unquote, captures him. But the funny thing is that, is, is that Gordon basically says like all this stuff is controlled by Wayne Enterprises, all the while never realizing that the Batman, that, that the Grim Knight is Bruce Wayne. Now, this is one of the big differences between the Grim Knight and the actual Batman from the, from the DC universe. Because the Grim Knight exists to eliminate crime everywhere he finds it, and because he's so effective at it, he had to believe that somewhere along the line, criminals would get their hands on Wayne Tech, uh, Wayne Tech, you know, Wayne Tech, you know, weapons and, and equipment, different things like that. And so what better way to kind of continue the war on that criminal element and destroy it than by basically saying, hey, look, we're effectively going to turn Wayne Enterprises Tech into like a two-way street that while they use it for their own ends, I can control it from the back end. And that's exactly what happens. Using his access to Wayne Technology, all the guards are taken out. Like they're they're all like all these cops are eliminated on the spot. That, that literally like this this kind of fight breaks out between Jim Gordon and uh and and Batman. But of course, Batman basically ends up making his escape, and Jim Gordon's kind of left with the with this information that was kind of brought to his attention, or at least from the 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 ramblings of the Batman who laughs, that he can essentially access Wayne Technology. Now, putting two and two together, because Wayne Technology is so advanced, and because Wayne Technology is not something that's just easily accessible from the back end, what it means is the only one who could really be able to access it is Bruce Wayne. And so what ends up happening here is Commissioner Gordon essentially draws the parallel. He draws a conclusion that Batman is Bruce Wayne. And in doing so, basically says he's public enemy, uh, enemy number one for, for Gotham City. And where he goes to guys like Rupert Thorne, who under normal circumstances in the DC universe are villains, and where he goes to guys like Two-Face, who are usually villains, but in this instance are actually like mayors. You know, they, they hold powerful positions in the city of Gotham, but they're not criminals because why would you want to be a criminal in the city of Gotham when you got Batman killing all the criminals he finds? That what he basically, you know, what Commissioner Gordon says is like, we have to track this guy down. We have to capture Bruce Wayne. I've got the backing of the FBI. Either you can join me in this or you can be left behind. And so it's one of those things where the, the that element kind of stays hands off. The FBI shows up to Wayne Manor alongside Commissioner Gordon and they basically call Bruce Wayne out. And it's kind of a cool thing because like this knockdown drag out fight happens between the two. But it's kind of a funny scenario here is because under normal circumstances, and, and it's, it's sort of strange that it works out this way, under normal circumstances, Commissioner Gordon should never have been able to get the upper hand on Bruce Wayne because Bruce Wayne's just such an effective fighter, right? Like, you know, hardcore Batman fans will say that's ridiculous, you know, but my answer to this is that most likely Commissioner Gordon got the upper hand because he has prep time. You know, I mean, if prep time works for Batman, prep time works for everything else. And so Commissioner Gordon gets the upper hand for, you know, for prep time. I actually have no idea if that's the answer or not. It, it's kind of strange. I mean, technically speaking, it shouldn't really happen, which is kind of a, an interesting concept, <laughs> an interesting idea. I'd really like to believe that one of the, one of the reasons why Commissioner Gordon was kind of able to get the upper hand on really the Grim Knight is because of the fact that the Grim Knight doesn't really rely on stealth and, and martial arts and things like that in the same capacity that Batman from the main DC universe does. That he's more of just like a like a broadsword, right? It's just like this this thing that just kind of swat, you know, just swings and just is designed to take out huge swaths of enemies. Whereas the main DC Batman is more like a scalpel. He's more like surgical precision. That's kind of kind of his whole MO. And so that more likely more like more likely kind of seems to be the way in which it happened. But what it did is it created a kind of animosity between the Grim Knight and Commissioner Gordon. The issue with this is that we're not really told what happened with the with Commissioner Gordon.
him in like the dark multiverse. We don't really know what, what happened to him. We don't know if he died. We don't know if like something took place that kept the Grim Knight from being able to enact his revenge. And the reason why is because once he's here, he intends to basically enact revenge on the main DC uh, Commissioner Gordon that he wanted to on the dark multiverse Commissioner Gordon. He essentially wants to like kill him on the spot. But the funny thing about this is that the Batman who laughs basically says like, that's kind of pointless here. We can do much, much worse to this guy than just kill him. If we kill him, it's an easy way out. If we kill him, then like he doesn't suffer anymore. But if you truly want him to suffer, then give it time. Let's implement our plan and let's bring down everything around him. It's kind of a cool thing because what this does is it sort of kind of hits to the idea that what we could be seeing is something akin to like a return to the killing joke, right? Like where you see like Commissioner Gordon being tortured with all these images of his daughter being violated and different things like that. We don't really know. Okay, what's going on guys? Um, we are continuing the Batman Who Laughs. And I don't know if you guys can tell, <coughs> but I am not feeling very good right now. Went to WrestleMania, which was awesome. Got caught in the rainstorm afterwards, which was not awesome. And so for the last couple of days, I have had like a stuffy nose and a sore throat and I've been coughing up some delicious lung butter. I am under the weather. So videos will be scant this week. Uh, there's this video today. There'll probably be one on Saturday and then we'll have like a video on Monday, I think. And then hopefully by Monday, we'll be back, like hopefully by the weekend, I'll be feeling better. We can like get back to normal uploads. If not, well, they'll be scant until I feel better. So anyway, uh, Batman Who Last Part 4. Okay, so this story actually kind of takes an insane turn. And, it, and it's kind of funny because people were kind of getting a little irritated. It was taking so long to come out. But one of the things you guys need to bear in mind is that DC's actually slowed down their releases. They've, they've decreased the number of books that are coming out. And they've also slowed down how often those books are coming out. So it's one of those things where they're, they're trying to sort of uh, navigate the waters on, you know, how comic books should be distributed and so on. It's always an ongoing process. It always happens every, I don't know, every five to 10 years. You know, it's always something along those lines that sort of sees shift but the fact remains that that initially where this picks up and it's kind of cool is remember batman had basically ingested like the joker toxin right like turned himself into the batman who laughs because from his perspective and the advice of everybody around him it was the only way he could really win and so one of the things that it kind of does is that with him sort of ingesting this this substance and then going through and, and kind of musing to us for a minute one of the things that he says is that when he is whenever he's going through and things get tough right like things get hard what he tries to do is see the world through the eyes of like the robins of of jason todd and tim drake and, and Dick Grayson and Damian Wayne. Now he says seeing the world through the eyes of the Robins, but he refers to them as his children. And so really seeing the world through their eyes kind of allowed Batman to see innocence, to sort of move away from the perspective of like the world is dark and dreary and everybody's bad and seeing it from the perspective of, hey, like sometimes people are just trying to do their best, but like not everything is so so black and white as adults really tend to see it. There's a lot of different shades of gray there. And so it was kind of cool because following this, we basically pick up with Alfred, who's just now realizing what Batman has done. And this is actually a really, really cool exchange. And the way that Scott Snyder does this is really nothing short of amazing because the way this plays out is Alfred freaks, like Alfred panics, right? Because for Alfred, it's like one of the worst case scenarios. And really contextually speaking, given the current situation, it is the worst case scenario. Alfred's fear is that Batman will be lost forever. That's the biggest thing that he goes through. And literally like Batman says, hey, look, I have this visor on because it allows me to differentiate things. And that was kind of cool because initially we didn't really know what the function of the visor, the, the Batman who, who laughs, we didn't really know what his purpose was. Honestly, I always thought it was just kind of for visual effect. And what Batman actually tells us, really Scott Snyder kind of says here, is that the visor serves a purpose. That what it does is it kind of allows the Batman who laughs to filter through all the different wants and desires that people have. But a person can use it for a variety of different ways. The Batman who laughs uses it in order to determine what people's most violent desires are. Batman can use it to see what their hopeful desires are. So it basically kind of allows you to see the, the, the desires, the wants, the needs of anybody that you look at. And so when it's taken away from Batman, it's kind of like his only real weapon. But from the perspective of Alfred, it's like, well, no, I'm trying to keep you from completing your desire to be the Batman who laughs. Like, it's not a really a thing that you need. It's a thing that you want because you're becoming the Batman who laughs. And it's kind of a cool thing because where Batman tries to reason with Alfred, Alfred in turn, like, smacks him across the head with it. And this is cool because what it does is it turns into a knockdown, drag out fight between Alfred and Batman. As this plays out, like, literally, Alfred is beating the crap, like, beating the crap out of Batman. And then Batman just not doing anything to stop him because he knows that the reality of this is that it's kind of coming from a place of love but as he looks at Batman or looks at Alfred what he sees is that where Alfred says hey look I love you he sees like you know kind of what the the venom is wanting him to see which is Alfred wants to hurt you he wants to bring you harm you have to get rid of him you have to kill him and it's kind of crazy because he sort of goes on like this rant and tears Alfred down where he's like all you've ever done is hold me back I've carried you all this time like literally spewing out every ounce of, of vindictiveness and anger that he possibly could and that's really kind of the nature of the toxin is that while it sort of twists you out as a person and it really kind 
kind of kind of you know warps your perspective it brings out all this anger and all this wrath because in reality it's almost like batman's being deprived of something that he feels he needs one of the things that i hope you guys are noticing here is this really seems to be a pretty strong allegory for like drug addiction and it's, it is kind of crazy when you look at it that way like when you sort of shift it up drug addiction alcoholism things like that like things that people are addicted to that negatively impact themselves and the people around them and that's why it's kind of crazy because you know batman's kind of lashing out at alfred like you don't want me to succeed you don't want me to, to benefit you don't want me to do well all you want to do is hold me back you know and all these different kinds of things just spewing out anger but it's not really batman talking it's literally the, the toxin kind of talking through batman it's driving his mind to a place that it doesn't really have any have any reason to go to and so again once batman sort of regains his sanity kind of comes back you know really sort of returns to himself some apologies are given back and forth between himself and alfred and batman basically explains this is what i have to do because there's no other way that i can win there's no conceivable way that i can beat this guy and now the cool thing is that following this where batman is kind of racing through the city it gives us a chance to sort of see how this visor impacts him right like when he goes through there and he uses this visor he looks around and he sees like people who are hopeful like basically like good people he sees their dreams what they what they look to aspire you know parents who hope that their child becomes something great in the world but then like what he also sees is the darker side people who want to murder each other who want to like pillage and destroy each other but it's kind of a cool scenario with this visor working the way it does and with the nature of gotham city the question i would pose to you is which one of these is the truth the version where like batman sees hopeful people or the people who are violent and destructive and just want to kill everything which one of these is true when it comes to the realm of gotham because gotham is a dark and violent place and it's kind of interesting because it's kind of scott snyder sort of asking that question like which one of these is real like which one of these is the actual real place now at this point we actually switch over to, to commissioner gordon son right like we switch, switch over to james gordon jr and again we talked about him in previous videos that james gordon was a legitimate psychopath but with batman bringing him out is kind of using his mind to kind of predict where the batman who lasts will go kind of using a crazy person to predict a crazy person more or less but as he's talking to james you know one, one of the things that james asks is, or really kind of makes this this argument on is batman's no kill rule and one of the things he says is that back when he was a psychopath and a serial killer that he was kind of like the no kill rule is stupid because like all batman really seems to do with his no kill rule is give criminals a second chance but he's giving criminals a second chance to commit crimes the only way to really deal with criminals and to get rid of them completely is to kill them a dead man cannot be a repeat offender and, and it's kind of a cool thing because when when he says that it's sort of hey look like this is how i view the world i thought your no kill rule was stupid because all you were doing was just basically letting criminals back out on the street you had this sort of you know really hopeful gosh golly they'll repent one day you know kind of kind of belief system but it never did any good you were a dribble in a hamster wheel you were just running in circles hoping things changed one day if you run long enough or run hard enough but they never really do but what he also says is at the same time one of the things that i've learned is that there are people out there who deserve second chances it's not that clear cut not everyone deserves a second chance but not everyone deserves to die for what they did you kind of have to take it on a case-by-case -case situation what he asks is he says hey look i know what you're trying to do here and i get where you're going with this the question i have is once the batman who laughs is defeated and when you defeat him do you have a fail safe do you have a way to bring yourself back and to basically cure yourself of this joker toxin and batman doesn't an answer and so the implication seems to be that no that once he becomes the, the batman who laughs there's no way to undo this that so he's going to be stuck this way the the fact remains that what what this ends up doing is kind of switching to like three hours prior and we have this awesome this awesome segment that takes place between batman and joker and it's so cool because when batman spins around and starts talking to joker like again he kind of hallucinates that like joker wants to kill him and so on and so forth but what the joker says is like i'm just here to talk and when batman starts asking questions like do you just want to talk do you want to laugh do you want to see like that you finally got what you want Wanted, the Joker says, no, this is not what I wanted. I did not want you to become the Batman who laughs. That if anybody's going to kill you, I, I want it to be me. More so than that, like you and I are intertwined forever. Like it, it's it's kind of crazy because it's like we are sort of irrevocably tied together, right? Like, you know, I'm the, the clown prince of crime. Like I'm the ultimate evil. You try to be the ultimate good, even though you're not really. And like we fight against each other. And that's basically it. But he basically says that like this is really the only way that you could win, right? Like this is the only way that you could possibly pull it off. But, you know, I believe that one day like I will kill you. And that will be the end of that. But until that day comes, I came here to simply tell you, good luck. And it's kind of interesting here because what Batman does is he addresses the Joker and he says, look, the people in my life, like Alfred, will not have the cojones to do what it takes, right? Like if I full on become the Batman who laughs, like if, if there's no way to bring me back from becoming the Batman who laughs, Commissioner Gordon, Alfred, like none of these guys will have the, the have the balls to do what it takes. So I need you to do that. And the Joker says, yes, if you become the Batman who laughs, I will kill you. It's a mercy killing. It's really Batman like 
relying on the Joker. Like, it's, I wouldn't go as far as to say like they become friends, but they become more allies than anything else. So again, like trying to track down these these portals, trying to trying to track down these sources. Batman ends up traveling to Blackgate Prison to the section that was really more of like a transition period, right? Like it was basically like a halfway house, so to speak, between those being brought in and then being sent to Arkham Asylum. And so as he goes through here, he ends up running into like this one cop, you know, who's kind of like, hey, look, you're the Batman who laughs. I'm going to blow your head off. <laughs> and Batman basically reasons with him and kind of reveals information like his wife and his daughter. His daughter has a little little bear, a little Batman doll that she squeezes and it laughs, which of course Batman never laughs. Batman doesn't like the fact that it laughs. And so he's kind of like, hey, look, that's how you know I'm Batman because I don't laugh. You know, and it's, and it's, and it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of a cool little thing. But still, like as he goes to this portal, he ends up in this version of Blackgate that's six times the size of the one in the main DC universe. And we end up finding out that in this one particular universe in the Dark Multiverse, that this version of Arkham Asylum is ran by Bruce Wayne himself and in this moment like when he starts addressing him and saying hey look like you're in danger people are going to come for you they're going to try to take you and they're going to try to eliminate you again we don't really know the reason why these different Bruce Waynes are being killed being taken and killed but we do know Batman's trying to save this one and in that moment they're yanked back in the main DC universe and where Batman tries to take this version of Bruce and basically hands him over to uh to this cop and says hey look keep an eye on him make sure nothing happens to him and then in turn deals with like the other officers who were showing up we end up finding out this cop is not actually a cop instead this cop is the Batman who laughs and that's crazy because basically like it's set it set batman up and it's kind of a cool thing because what he says is like i know everything that you're going to do batman who laughs knows everything bruce wayne is going to do and that's the difference here is that bruce wayne is basically like he transformed himself into the batman who laughs but he's not actually thinking like the batman who laughs he's thinking like bruce wayne and so it's basically snyder kind of saying hey look you're really gonna have to give yourself over and become this dark and sinister version with a tiny ounce of yourself governing your actions in order to fully be able to defeat this guy otherwise like there's no real way for you to win. And so what the Batman Who Laughs does, masquerading as this cop, is he tells all the other officers that Batman is the Batman Who Laughs. He basically killed Bruce Wayne. He's got a trigger device. He's going to blow himself and everybody else up. Kill him. Take him out now. And all the other officers around them open fire on Batman. Okay, so we are covering the Batman Who Laughs Part Five, and again, like like the Batman Who Laughs is solid. Like it's it's one of the coolest things. But in the in the last video that we had, the way we kind of left off was that the Batman Who Laughed essentially like tricked these cops at, at Arkham Asylum into believing that like the actual Batman was the Batman Who Laughs. And again, this is kind of a kind of a cool uh, cool scheme because what better way to make an escape than to look at your current circumstance and then find it out that way, right? Like it's the best way to do it. It's the Art of War by by Sun Tzu, right? Like don't fight on their tour, uh, territory, fight on your territory use your skills against them batman undertook the the task of becoming the batman who laughs in order to figure out a way to defeat him and in doing so almost engineered his own demise and this 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 first bit of the comic really picks up with him just being like shot at by all these cops and the batman who laughs teleporting away and batman tries to reason with him but but remember because he's sort of turning into his evil counterpart what this means is that this darker side is beginning to take hold a little more than it had before now it's an internal struggle that's constantly going on between the two of them but the idea here is he says okay look there's a part of me that just wants to kill these guys and be done with it but i can't he's basically fleeing for his life now because it suits kevlar it makes it almost impossible for them to basically penetrate so then they start calling in like armor piercing rounds now here's a kind of crazy thing here is the way this is happening the way this is going down is kind of difficult for batman to differentiate between what's actually happening and what's not actually happening because remember he's basically you know using the mask of the batman who laughs he sees people's darker intentions and he hears what he wants to hear and so what this means is that he's hearing them say things like shoot for the mouth you know we can't we can't penetrate his suit so just shoot him in the mouth which always made sense why not just shoot batman in the throat but the question that's kind of being asked here is are they really saying that or does batman believe they're saying that and the implication is that it goes either way from there batman realizes the only way to really make an escape is to pretend to be the person they fear so much and that's exactly what he does he sits down and he says okay fine it's my only out here so he starts running off the names and the addresses and all the things that he knows about these cops that are familiar to him and basically says if you do not let me leave here i will find you i will track you down and i will kill everyone and everyone you ever met like i'll kill you and everybody that you ever met here and it's, and it's cool because it scares them out of their wits and he says i'm the batman who laughs follow me down if you want to and then basically makes his escape and that's kind of the cool thing here is because batman's not actually becoming the batman who laughs he's pretending but it allows him to kind of tie into that character it works both ways if the batman who laughs can use bruce wayne as his own means of escape by basically tricking everybody into believing that, that bruce wayne is actually the batman who laughs then bruce wayne can build on that use that to his own end
hands. It's one of the ways to show that Batman's very quick on his feet. But from here, of course, it really kind of catches Commissioner Gordon making his escape. And this is one of the things that's kind of interesting is because when it comes to like the little Robins that the Batman who laughs had at his disposal, we never really knew who they were or where they were from. But what we're actually told here is these are all different versions of the son of Jim Gordon. Now, in reality, I would probably say that this is kind of Scott Snyder just throwing it out there, that there was never really any intention to explain where they came from. So just kind of tied into the story and then to say, well, they're all your versions of, of you know, all the versions of your son, Jim Gordon, from like different places in the Dark Multiverse. But it's cool because it's a way to torment Jim Gordon. Now, remember, this is basically like the Punisher Batman, more or less, who's um, people, you can call him whatever you want to, you know, but like it's Punisher Batman, more or less, <laughs> is really what it is. But basically, it's him just kind of tormenting Jim Gordon. Remember, the vendetta between the two is really only one sided. That in the, the universe that he comes from, the Grim Knight is basically a guy who was like defeated by Jim Gordon. He was a vigilante Punisher Batman who was eventually caught up to and defeated by Jim Gordon. And Jim Gordon's eyes, he's just kind of a, cr a kind of a crazy guy and a maniac. But in the Grim Knight's eyes, it's hey, like you, you defeated me in your universe, so I'm going to defeat you in yours. It's, it's kind of a twisted sort of scenario. But again, in the midst of all this, Jim Gordon making his escape, he's caught up to by his son. And uh, basically, you know, his son kind of helps him get out of there and, and, you know, recover and so on. But from here, we switch over back to the Batman who laughs in one of the coolest parts of the story, because the question is asked, like, why have you come here? And it's like, well, I came here because I wanted to address you because I wanted to talk to you because I have a small favor, you know, and, all, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of kind of this disembodied voice. And as soon as I heard that, as soon as I saw that, I was like, OK, he's talking to the Court of Owls. And that's exactly what it is. It's one of the coolest things. The Batman who laughs meets the Court of Owls. And this is awesome because the Court of Owls is like this really clandestine organization that ran Gotham behind the scenes. We know that from Scott Snyder's run on the New 52 Batman. And it's so cool to see him kind of wrap back around to what he originally created and sort of tie it in to the, con uh, to the content going forward. It's awesome. Now, the funny thing about this is that the Court of Owls traditionally allows the, the youngest member of the court to choose what's going to happen to a particular person who's either been brought there or who has strayed into the path of the Owls and doesn't really know what they're getting into. And so the youngest person basically comes out. You know, you literally have the Batman who laughs. He says, hey, look, you know, all I have is a small favor. Like, that's, that's all I really have. You know, and the youngest person says, no, 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 we're not giving you anything. We're going to take you out. And so what ends up happening is they basically say, like, the Talons are going to kill you. Now, of course, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with the Court of Owls, the Talons are basically their henchmen. They're the people they send after you to either kill you or bring you to the court or whatever the case is. But that's when the Batman who laughs says, but that's the thing, though, guys. Like, I've already talked to your Talons and I've removed their arms. This is how crazy the Batman who laughs is, how dangerous he is. He gets in there and says, okay, what's the most immediate threat to me if I walk into where the Court of Owls are? Okay, well, then the most immediate threat is the Talons. But Batman who laughs is not walking into this blind. And that's cool because what he says is that in another universe in the Dark Multiverse, because of how extreme you guys were and how crazy you guys were, there was a kind of respect between yourself and like Bruce Wayne. And so in an alternate, in a, in a Dark Multiverse, there was a time when Bruce Wayne took over the Court of Owls and he became the head of the court, the new town, and he controlled everything. And so like, I'm well aware of who you guys are. I know what you guys are about. You guys are just rich folks. You guys use talents to do your bidding. But when your talents are gone, what are you guys? You're nothing. You're, you guys are weak. You guys are, you guys can't do anything on your own without people protecting you. It's kind of interesting. And so of course this leads directly to like the arrival of this Batman from the dark multiverse who took over the Court of Owls facing off against like the Batman who laughs. Now, of course he's defeated pretty quickly. And so what we do is we switch back over to Batman man and to, to Jim Gordon. Now, the cool thing about this is that, remember, one of the big talking points here was the last laugh program, right? Like the idea that basically this, this could be activated and initiated and it would cut Gotham, uh, Gotham off from like the rest of the world, right? Like it would cut, them off, uh, cut it off from the rest of the United States. Water, electricity, the whole nine yards, everything would be cut off and Gotham would become a totally self-contained ecosystem. And Batman's plan with Commissioner Gordon was to do that, was to activate the last laugh program to cut Gotham off to make sure that nothing that Batman who last put in the waterways could be expanded and, and basically extended out into the rest of the country. But that's when Batman begins to think, well, that's what the Batman who laughs wants. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of like, well, what if, the, what if this is what he wanted all along? What if what the Batman who laughs wanted all along was for Gotham to be closed off? Was for Gotham to become its own source of power? For Gotham to be isolated and removed from everything and to become its own place? But if he did, then the question is why? And that's when he gets a call from the Batman who laughs and he's told, do not answer that call. Do not respond to that call where he kind of takes his hand off the 
the device and says, no, 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 you know, we we will we will give it a minute or two, you know, because you got a two minute countdown, right? Like once once a, the first hand is put on there, it takes a two hand system. Once the first hand is put on there, you've got two minutes in order to activate the whole thing. And that's when he basically says, okay, let's see where this goes. Let's see what happens with this. He's talking to the Batman who laughs. And the Batman who laughs says, you don't understand the true basis behind Gotham. Now, this is kind of a cool thing. There will be those who will kind of look at that and say, oh man, here we go again. Batman doesn't know everything about Gotham, whatever. Like the cool thing about this is, is uh, I love the idea that Scott Snyder introduces this idea that Batman doesn't know as much about Gotham as he thinks he does. And that's what's so awesome is because what it does is it almost kind of paints Batman in this light of being arrogant. That Batman, you're not as smart as you believe you are. And that's what the Batman who laughs basically says, that the way that Gotham was originally built, the way it was originally designed, Gotham was designed to be a seat of power. That Gotham was designed to be a city where the person who ruled it could essentially extend their influence out to the rest of the world in a myriad of different ways. You could cut it off. You could shut it off from the rest of the world. And you could say like, Gotham is totally isolated and alone. And this is awesome because again, like it gives like whoever it is that controls Gotham or who's, who's sitting on Gotham if this last life program is operated will essentially be able to like operate outside of the United States and do their own thing. Like you can poison the rest of the world and Gotham will be fine. And that's kind of the cool thing here is because what ends up happening is like Batman is, is literally being talked to by Jim Gordon and they're saying like, don't listen. Alfred's, Alfred's coming in. Alfred's chiming in. Don't listen. And Batman can't help but listen. Batman can't help but hear what's going on. And, and what he ends up doing is actually agreeing with the Batman who laughs. The Batman who laughs says like, press the button, put your hand, cut Gotham off from the rest of the world. Let Gotham be what it's supposed to be. Let it be its darker side. And Alfred is kind of crazy. Alfred chimes in for a second and says, hey, look, like you're not, you're not supposed to do this. You're, you are the living heart of Gotham. You're the guy that tries to make the city a better place. And Batman's responses, and it hasn't worked. He's not fixing anything. And so what, what ends up happening is like in the final moments of this, Batman puts his hand on the machine and basically follows through with the plan of the Batman who laughs and shuts down the entire connection between Gotham and everything else. And so essentially Batman has joined the Batman who laughs and it's pretty awesome. Like it's, it's pretty solid. Okay, so we are getting back into Dark Knight's, not Dark Knight's Metal, <laughs> the Batman Who Laughs. And again, like in the last video that we had, we were talking about the nature of like the Last Laugh Protocol, right? And how Batman had activated it. Now, for those of you guys who were catching up, the Last Laugh Protocol was a protocol designed by Batman for the purpose of like cutting off Gotham from the rest of essentially like the world, right? Like just totally isolating the city in its entirety in case something happened, like the Joker decided to release Joker toxin into the water system or something like that. Batman could activate it and keep the toxin from spreading through out like the rest of the country, the surrounding cities, different things like that. And so because of the, because of the whole situation, the way it's unfolding, when Batman activated this, then it suddenly turned into, okay, Batman's basically sided against everyone. And that was kind of where we were left, right? Like we were left with this idea that Batman is sided against like, like everybody. And he had basically joined the Batman who laughs. And that's kind of the funny thing because where you have Alfred in his ear telling him, Hey, look, like your toxicity levels are getting super high. If you keep doing what you're doing, like if you go into any kind of situation that heightens your adrenaline, then you're going to switch over to the Batman who laughs laughs, right? Because your cells are almost completely irradiated with his whole formula uh, and you're going to end up turning into him. And that's when Batman kind of chimes in and says, no, 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 no. I didn't activate this because I'm becoming the Batman who laughs. I activated this because it's the only chance we have. And that's kind of the cool thing because then you have the son of Commissioner Gordon who comes in and says, yeah, it basically buys us time. Now, remember the son of James Gordon, you know, James Gordon Jr. is basically crazy and like a serial killer, right? And so bringing him in here, it's kind of, it's kind of Batman's way of being able to see into the eye of a crazy person. But the issue with this is that as Batman has slowly started to become the Batman who laughs, what it's done is this kind of altered his perspective to where he can sort of see directly into his mind and not, not literally, but insofar as functioning akin to him and how he thinks. And that's what he says. I pretty much am him. Like I, I almost am the Batman who laughs. I know his one real weakness. I know where all of this is leading to. And so what this does is it allows them to essentially set a trap, taking over the entirety of the power grid and allowing it only to really be controlled from, uh, from, from the Batcave. What it means is like, they're the only person that can do anything with it. Now, of course, Batman Batman also acknowledges that the Grim Knight, right, like the, the Punisher Bat, uh, Batman from an alternate reality, can basically like hack into the power grid and do whatever it is they need to do. But it'll take time to achieve that, which buys them time they didn't have before. And so again, it's kind of a cool little moment because we basically switch over to like an alternate reality when you end up having like some version of Bruce Wayne that basically bought everything, right? Like literally bought everything in Gotham City. <laughs> like everything runs under under like the funding of Bruce Wayne. So like he privatized, uh, privatized the entire, like all the city services, the police, 
the fire department, the whole nine yards. And where somebody could do that and use it for nefarious ends, he actually did it for, for basically a benefit, essentially saying like, so long as my company makes money, you guys will be funded. And you're no longer relying on taxpayer dollars, which means taxpayer dollars can actually be used towards things that can truly benefit society as opposed to just, you know, funding cops and all that kind of good stuff. And so as a result of that, we end up having this alternate reality version of Batman that basically vanishes, right? This alternate reality version of Bruce that just kind of gets whisked away when the Batman who laughs goes to take him out. And of course, that's when he really kind of chimes in and says that it's Bruce Wayne who did it. Now, following this is a really, really cool exchange that takes place between Commissioner James Gordon and his son, James Gordon Jr. And Jr. tries to like talk to his father, right? And almost seems to try to make the, you know, pitch this case that when it's all said and done and, you know, and the, and the smoke clears that like they should consider setting him free. And the response of Jim is no, because I just don't trust you because I think you're still crazy. I think you're still insane. Like the, like all indications here are that he still believes his son is a villain, that he'll try to get him the help he needs and he'll try to make sure they're treated fairly. But it's like, he doesn't view him as his own son. He views him as like a criminal he happens to be working with that seems to share the same name as him. And it's one heck of a way for a father to view a son in a way that's almost kind of like hopeless. It's pretty dark and it's pretty twisted and it's pretty grim. But from there, again, we kind of switch back over to Batman in this fight he has with the Batman who laughs. And this is kind of a cool moment because when, when Bruce Wayne shows up here, of course, the Batman who laughs is hot on his trail and basically says, hey, like, like, you know, Bruce is like, I knew you were going to be here. And Batman who laughs is like, yeah, I knew you were going to be here too. And you're slowly, you know, turning into me. And it's almost kind of like mind games. And that's one of the things that you don't really see when it comes to Bruce Wayne. When it comes to him, like, like toying with people, it's usually based on fear, right? It's usually based on the idea of like, I'm going to use fear to try to overcome you. So it is mind games insofar as he plays on people's psychological perspective of like fear and, and all that kind of good stuff. But with a Batman who laughs, he's really more just maniacal. And so seeing him play mind games with Bruce Wayne, like, yes, man, you're becoming me. Like you're slowly turning into me. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, like you believe you have this great, big, huge, grandiose plan set, but I promise you this was all according to me. Like everything that's happening here is, is happening because I wanted it to. It's kind of a cool little exchange. Now we know the Batman who laughs really loves doing that. I mean, we've seen from the stories, you know, the way the stories have been written, that he loves focusing and kind of messing with people's individual minds. He talks about things like killing the entire Bat family. You know, when you had like Bruce Wayne, who was kind of like, you know, I, I guess when, when he was turning into the Batman who laughs, when the toxin first began to infect him, uh, it was kind of like, okay, I can maintain my sanity. I can maintain who I am. And, and all it takes is the smallest push, the smallest nudge over the edge, kind of a homage to, to the killing joke with all it takes is one bad day. And so what he ends up saying here is that like, hey, when it came to the, to the Bat family in my universe, where I come from, I wanted to make sure they were aware of what was going on. So I invited them over for tea and setting the tea out was enough of an adrenaline push to push me over the edge. And when they showed up, I killed them all. It's just, it's, it's little things like that, right? Like just kind of like, this is how twisted and screwed up you're going to become. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And so following that, you know, again, kind of switching back over to, to Commissioner Gordon and, and James Gordon Jr. We get this really cool segment, right? Where like they entered into the Bat Armory. And then of course, when they come out and the Grim Knights, there, kind of going crazy and doing all kinds of bonkers stuff. They end up busting out with like these Batman Beyond costumes and it looks amazing. Like it's, it's, it's pretty badass. <laughs> I'm almost inclined to call this like the Batman who laughs beyond, right? Like, because it's it's so cool to see like these little these little homages, right? Because when when you're Scott Snyder and you're sitting down and you're writing a story about the Batman mythos, it's huge and it's expansive, right? And Batman Beyond is a is a beloved show for a lot of people, right? They grew up watching that show, they thought it was amazing. Um, and I'm curious, like like how much do you guys love Batman Beyond? I'm kind of curious about that because it was after my time, but a lot of you guys really seem to enjoy it. I mean, it is pretty cool. Like, it is it's a pretty cool concept. But again, like them showing up here with the intention of being able to take out the Grim Knight. They they actually get dealt with pretty quickly, right? And, and, and it seems that they're kind of taken out pretty fast, but it is a cool moment because what you have are these kind of battles going on in two fronts, right? You've got, you've got the Grim Knight versus Jim Gordon, because remember in the Grim Knight's reality, he was defeated by Commissioner Gordon. So he kind of holds a grudge against seemingly anybody who's Commissioner Gordon in any universe, regardless of where it is. And then of course you've got Batman and you've got the Batman who laughs. But between the Grim Knight and Jim Gordon, what he does is kind of hit on him and say, hey man, like you're not as great as you think you are. In my reality, you gave up on your son. Like you look at your son as a person who couldn't be fixed, who was incorrigible. Essentially, everything that you're saying now about your son is all the things that you said in my universe. So yeah, you're as crappy as I think you are. You're nowhere near as great as you believe you are. And, and it's kind of a cool thing. It's kind of a cool moment because what it does is it puts it in a perspective that like Jim Gordon really like kind of, you know, hearkening back to the things he said to his son is not that great of a human being. He just kind of gave up on his son, which is something that no person should ever, you know, no parent should ever give up on their child. And so it's kind of like, what kind of a parent is he really? Now, again, of course, the fight between Batman and the Batman who laughs, I 
think is a lot more desperate because in this fight, what you have here is essentially Batman not really fighting the, the Batman who laughs so much as fighting to become that version of himself, right? I mean, because it's, it's the one thing he seems to be the most terrified of, becoming some twisted version of himself that's bent by nothing but chaos and evil, and all it wants to do is just like inflict as much damage, death, and destruction as it can. Like, Batman's terrified of that. The Joker takes hold, basically, and like, he's infected forevermore. And like, having an Earth where there's two Batman who laugh running around, that would be bonkers. Like, I mean, you're talking about probably the death of the Justice League, you're talking about the deaths of most of the superheroes because you have all the ingenuity and all the intelligence of Batman combined with all the insanity and the chaotic nature of the Joker, and then you double that, and then you set it loose on the superhero community. What hope does anybody have, right? So like, Batman's not just fighting for himself, he's kind of fighting for the world in a lot of different ways. And that's really when he kind of hits at it, you know, when the Batman who laughs talks about a lack of hope, and he says, you have no real hope here, and there's nothing you can really do to win. The response of, of, of Bruce is, I have one hope. Like, like I found a universe where there is a version of Bruce Wayne that is hopeful, where there is a version of Bruce Wayne that hasn't given up yet, that hasn't like gone down this dark path that I've set myself on. And it's basically the child version of himself from a different universe. And of course, this version comes running in and Bruce is like, hey, go with them, go take off to the Batcave. It's designed to be hopeful. And that's kind of the crazy thing because what this does is it seems to hit at the idea that Bruce Wayne expects to die, that bringing that version of himself over into the universe will basically lead to him dying, right? That, that kind of seems to be the case. Now, again, I doubt that's exactly what will happen, but it's almost kind of like Bruce Wayne is expecting that, right? Because it's like, okay, I'm probably going to die in this fight. And if I do, somebody else needs to carry on the, the, the Batman mantle. And there's a version of myself out there. I want him to have the life that I never had for myself, right? Like almost kind of like a parent of sorts. And so it's cool to see this, this little, little bit of a scenario play out. And so again, like, again, we you know with Commissioner Gordon and with the Grim Knight, Commissioner Gordon's basically toppled. He's essentially taken out. It kind of goes back and forth and back and forth. And so in this last little bit of the story where things begin to kind of close out, the Batman who laughs ultimately gets the upper hand and like going to attack Bruce Wayne, he manages to subdue him, grab the serum he has in his possession and inject it into Bruce Wayne, essentially turning Bruce Wayne into the Batman who laughs. It's one of the coolest things. Like it's one of the most awesome things ever. And I, I am hyped for this. So again, a relatively short issue, really more action than anything else, but it's pretty solid. Okay, so we are getting into the Batman Who Last Part 7. Okay, what we've really covered up to this point is we were basically talking about like the near collapse of Gotham City, right? And for those of you guys who read Batman Endgame, this felt a lot like it, right? And that's one of the reasons why it, for the foreseeable future, people will usually reference that story because there were stories that came before Endgame, like Batman No Man's Land and different things like that. But Endgame was like this first real big instance that we saw where a singular villain managed to almost completely topple the entirety of Gotham City. And in fact, Joker did. He exposed the entire city of Gotham to the Joker toxin and drove the whole town insane. And so it was kind of a question of how in the world can Batman possibly pull that off? Now, again, it was... It was, it was cool in terms of how Joker was defeated and how it all came to an end and, and the fight between himself and Batman that kind of led to their respective deaths, which allowed Commissioner Gordon to take over Batman during the DCU initiative. But the idea behind this is it's really kind of Scott Snyder drawing on what he's done before. And, and that's really where this sort of picks up, right? I mean, at this moment, you've basically got the idea of the... the kind of initiative that Batman set in motion that would cut Gotham off from like the rest of the world, right? Like if it was initiated, basically it would take water from the various locations around Gotham and it would dump it into the rest of the city and essentially quote unquote, try to fix it. It would isolate Gotham, you know, from the rest of the world, basically it'd be totally cut off. And it was the Batman who laughs using this as a means to basically turn Gotham city upside down. Now, the reason why this is so significant and the reason why this really differs from the events of Batman's uh, Batman in game is because Batman in game was a result of the Joker toxin, right? And like Batman's found cures for that. There's always a way to cure that with this the the really the serum of the batman who laughs there's no real cure for it. Nobody knows how to get rid of it, right? So if he succeeded and he did the exact same thing the Joker did, it would destroy Gotham. And that's one of the things that Scott Snyder had kind of been hitting on and basically trying to tell us, like, look, if the Batman who laughs wins, there's no turning back, right? You can't unring that bell. It's all over for the city of Gotham. And so it's basically been Batman trying to stop him ever since. But with Batman having been exposed to the serum, he's been slowly losing his mind and becoming the Batman who laughs. And that kind of leads to the fight between the two of them that's taking place here in this cemetery, more or less. Now, remember, the idea of this child version of Batman being here. We'll talk about him here in a second. But the idea of this child Batman being here is really that Batman who laughs brought him here for the sake of taunting Bruce and then of course, you know, taking out the kid. But what ends up happening here is Batman who laughs basically says, hey, look, I've got this serum and basically I've got this, this light on here. When this light turns red, it means you're fully changed and then like you gotta go. So it's basically kind of a, a countdown timer to the end of Bruce. And it's this cool little moment because when this plays out, like when this happens, it's really more of, of Bruce trying to play the game with a Batman who laughs and trying to use psychological warfare to win. Ultimately, it doesn't really work. 
work. But it's kind of a cool little moment because he's sort of like, okay, because you got the Batman who laughs standing here pointing a gun at his head and saying like, once this is done, like I have this kid here, this kid's going to be infected. He's going to be my quote unquote offspring for lack of a better word. He's going to carry on the mantle of everything that I've done. Uh, and, and like, you're going to do the exact same thing in this universe. And Batman's kind of like, yes, man, he's going to kill himself. <laughs> this is awesome. This works. He's like, yeah, I'll do it, man. I'll do it. And of course we end up finding out the Batman who laughs was playing the joke. And it was kind of a cool thing because what Bruce had done here is in these little vestiges, this is one of the reasons why Scott Snyder is so good at writing Batman is Bruce had thought of almost everything of, of pretty much everything in this circumstance, right? Like the, everything that the Batman who laughs is, is Bruce Wayne and the Joker, right? So the Batman who laughs would do what Bruce Wayne does. And in fact, we'll actually see uh, Batman pick up on this and, and use this to his advantage with a plan that he had concocted later on in the story. But basically what he'd done is he had used a piece of Wayne tech inside his own suit to turn the device red, basically tricking, trying to trick the Batman who laughs into believing that like it's time for him to go, right? Like he can just like shoot himself because everything's taken care of now and all that kind of good stuff. And of course, Batman who laughs catches in, it catches up to it. So right off the bat, that kind of gets snuffed. But again, this is what Snyder's hitting on with regards to the relation between the two. Everything Bruce Wayne could think of, the Batman who laughs is thought of. And that's why Snyder always told us the Batman who laughs is the most dangerous foe that Batman's ever faced. None of those villains think the way that Bruce Wayne does. None of them like know what his moves would be before he makes them and then knows how to counter them. That's why Batman who laughs is so dangerous because he is Bruce Wayne. He's just Bruce Wayne from a different universe. Their lives unfolded almost the exact same way up to the point where their parents died. And then the Batman who laughs basically snapped and, and his whole origin story unfolds. So it's cool to see this, this whole scenario take place here. But it's this cool little moment because while all this is going on, remember, you also have Commissioner Gordon and his son facing off against the Grim Knight. I call him Punisher Batman because that's basically what he is. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a cool thing because remember, the Grim Knight comes from a universe where his version of Commissioner Gordon defeated him. His version of Commissioner Gordon managed to get the upper hand on him and took him out. And so he's kind of harboring a grudge here. It's really one of these things where the Batman who laughs is, what if you could come to a universe where I could destroy that version of Bruce Wayne and you could destroy that version of Commissioner Gordon? The Grim Knight was on board. He was like, I'm down, right? So that's kind of why the grudge exists between the two of them. Now, remember, the son of Commissioner Gordon, James, is a serial killer. He's a psychopath. And so it's, it's one of these things where Commissioner Gordon's kind of working reluctantly with his son, but his son is truly on his side here. He's truly trying to do the right thing. You're essentially watching two battles being fought at the same time. And so where you have these drones that are showing up here, they're grabbing the water, believing that it's safe water and they're going to take it to Gotham City in order to basically ensure that the water supply is pure so we don't run into things like Batman Endgame. That's the whole reason why Batman set this whole system in motion. You end up having Commissioner Gordon, you know, kind of exposed to this water. Of course, he holds his breath, but it's kind of a crazy thing because in turn, the Grim Knight basically says like, we like, I know you're a psychopath. I know you're crazy. I know you hate your father for locking you away. Show him, show your father how much you hate him. And in turn, like, like literally James Gordon Jr. just starts like stabbing away. And it's one of the craziest things, right? To see this all go under. Well, then you switch back over to, to Alfred. And then you've got, you know, Alfred kind of showing up with a, with a machine gun and spraying down the Batman who laughs. <laughs> or not really with a machine gun, I'm sorry, with a shotgun and like spraying down the Batman who laughs. Now it's only a couple shots and it's kind of a cool moment. Of course, he doesn't really kill him, but this is the nature of Alfred. And this is one of the reasons why Alfred is so cool is because when you look at his character in, in the Batman comics, it's very easy to dismiss Alfred Pennyworth as like the father figure, like the mentor guy. But the important thing about Alfred is he is the Swiss army knife of the Batman family. He can do it all, right? He's a trained medic. He was in the military. So right there, he's got all the medical and military experience under his belt. It's cool here because when that all goes down, Alfred does what he can, but then in turn, the Batman who laughs basically tells the story of Alfred. And he's like, you don't know about what happened to you on my universe. And this is one of the darkest points of the story, right? Like the whole Batman who laughs thing. It's one of the most screwed up aspects. The Batman who laughs basically says like, in my universe, I killed all the superheroes. That's true. I killed everybody in the Justice League. I killed Superman. I literally twisted everybody inside out in the entirety of my universe. Either they're dead or they're basically running around as people who laugh, whatever the case is. But you, my friend, you are still alive. Basically what I did here is I took you and I stuck you down in, in like one of the sub caves and I fed you scraps and I kept you exposed to darkness. You were basically in a, a in like sensory dep uh, deprivation and I whispered to you and I talked to you and it took a year, but I broke you and you are my most dedicated servant. It's screwed up. In reality, like that's a fate worse than death, right? To spend a year being stuck in a place that you cannot escape from, that you can't really see out of, being tormented by nothing more than like the fact that the entire Bat family died and you couldn't save your surrogate son because he's the one doing all this. And then in turn, eventually just kind of snapping and breaking. Like it's, it's gotta be a fate worse than death. And so you basically have Batman who shows up and he basically starts fighting against the Batman who laughs alongside Alfred. And this is when we get the plan of Batman. And this is one of those things when it really kind of comes down to, okay, Batman's always got a way out, right? It's, it's one of these things. It wouldn't really be much of a Batman story if he didn't win, right? I mean, Batman's always got a way out. Well, yeah, because it's a Batman story. I mean, it wouldn't really be much of a Batman comic if he died in the first issue because he couldn't find a way out. But essentially what goes down here is there's like these, these uranium tipped hollowed, uh, hollowed harpoons. And basically like Batman fires them at him 
time at the at the Batman who laughs incapacitates him and is like the reason why I did this like why they're all here you know they're they're basically you know electrical devices you know they're essentially great big huge uh great big huge tasers but the reason why I did this is I set traps in every single location that was significant to me because I knew that's where you would go and this is one of the cool things because what Snyder's kind of been showing here is that in the entire fight between the Batman who laughs Bruce Wayne's been on defense the Batman who laughs makes a move and then Bruce Wayne counters and the Batman who laughs makes a move and then Bruce Wayne counters it's never really been Bruce Wayne on the offensive where he's finally got the upper hand and is taking it to the Batman who laughs that's never been the case now it's really been Snyder building up the nature of the Batman who laughs and saying this is why he's so dangerous is because he's always got the upper hand on Bruce and Bruce is always against the ropes but it is kind of a cool thing to finally see Bruce get the upper hand on him because he in turn electrocutes the piss out of him <laughs> and then starts beating, beating the crap out of him with the gravestone of his mom right with like Martha Martha Wayne's gravestone why did you say that name <laughs> because it was done by a terrible writer named Zack Snyder <laughs> Zack Snyder was a terrible screenwriter. <laughs> Why would anybody allow him to make a movie? But but nonetheless, so uh, with this whole thing, like this 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 fight, it's it's cool because what we end up learning is that like the the person that James Gordon Jr. was was stabbing was not Commissioner Gordon; it was actually the Grim Knight. Like he literally stabbed him to death, and it's kind of a cool thing because what this shows is a couple things about the Grim Knight. One, it shows he's not nearly as capable as Batman. Two, it shows he doesn't have the foresight of Batman, and three, he doesn't have the fighting prowess of Batman. Right? Like he's a half measure. It's interesting here because like the Grim Knight is taken out of the picture like that. Some people may be against that because he was written out so quickly, but in reality, he was nothing more than a henchman. He was the Batman who laughs equivalent to a Robin, right? He was just kind of there and, and just sort of doing whatever he needed to do in order to take them take him out. And that was basically it. But then you basically follow up with like the surprise victory because what ends up happening here is while Batman sort of snaps and gives into his darker half. And it's just like, I love this idea of just letting go and just tearing things up, like just wrecking the Batman who laughs. Suddenly, like he's saved by the Joker who fires the shot in the Batman who laughs and seems to kill him, like seems to take him out. Now, in response to this, the entire drone system is also taken down and it's all basically wiped clean and, and everything's sort of reset. Now, with, with that being the case, Gotham City is basically saved and it kind of begs the question, what happened to the Batman who laughs? Like, is he dead? It's kind of a cool little thing here because what you end up doing is basically following up with Batman who laughs talking to Alfred Pennyworth about two weeks after this had all gone down. And what you end up learning is that there was some, basically like a blood sample that was taken from the, the kid version of Bruce Wayne that was used to synthesize a serum that could cure Bruce Wayne of his, you know, Batman who laughs exposure. And the reason why is because with the Batman Who Laughs serum, it was created in the Dark Multiverse, right? So the only cure available for it would come from the Dark Multiverse. And that's kind of what Batman says. And it's kind of Scott Snyder basically saying that, essentially saying, hey, look, if it had been created in the main DC universe, I could use a blood sample from an, an alternate reality version of myself from just some other universe out there and everything would be okay, right? But it's like trying to trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The only way to cure a Dark Multiverse illness or disease is to find a cure in the Dark Multiverse because it's almost like a kind of genetic, or I guess, atomic structure of how it works and all that kind of stuff. It just kind of aligns. I don't know if that makes any sense, right? I mean, I, hopefully it does. It's kind of finicky the way that it, the way that it's done here. But essentially, the Batman who laughs has been taken and held captive and exists under the Hall of Justice as a prisoner. Now, the reason why this matters and the reason why it's significant is it's not Scott Snyder just kind of giving us a throwaway explanation. It's Scott Snyder telling us he can return at any point in time. But right? if he had killed the Batman who laughs, then he'd be gone, right? Because DC doesn't really play it fast and loose with death like Marvel does, right? Like once a character's dead, they usually stay dead for a pretty significant amount of time. It's not like Marvel Comics where a character dies and then like six issues later, they'll bring them back from, you know, by some hand wavy explanation, you know, Cosmic Cube or Infinity Gauntlet or whatever it is they want it to be, or they were never actually dead. It was a trick the whole time. You know, they never really do that. They've done it sporadically, like with Batman, you know, Batman was supposed to have died, at the, you know, during Final Crisis when he was hit by the Omega sanction of, of Darkseid. And then instead, like he was just time displaced because Batman's too popular to kill. Like it was, it was just different things like that. And so it, it worked for what it was because what you end up having is Commissioner Gordon and his son basically making amends, kind of getting together and saying, hey, look, you know, let's let's see if we can work forward from here. Uh, but it's Bruce Wayne basically sitting down with with Alfred and saying, hey, look, like oh, I've been thinking about everything the Batman who laughs said, right? Like everything the Batman who laughs has told me is this, like he's traveled around the multiverse and he's seen all these different versions of myself. And as far like from what he tells me, I'm the most ineffective one, right? Like I'm the loneliest one, I'm the angriest one, I'm the most bitter one, and I'm the one that's done the least to make Gotham a better place. And it's, and it's cool because what he what he does is he looks around and he says, that's right, right? And that's, that's kind of the funny thing is because when you go through 
through the Batman Who Laughs and you see these alternate reality versions of Bruce, there's one where Bruce Wayne used all his money to basically make Gotham City a much better place, kind of like this beacon for the world, almost a metropolis. Uh, there's all these different versions of Bruce Wayne that have gone on to do great things. The version of Bruce in, in the DC universe, he sucks. Like he's a, he's, it's, it's the argument that I made before, right? Like he's done nothing to make Gotham City better than what it was. If anything, it's worse because now there's super villains uh, flying around. And so you've got like, you got this, this system where you've got this super rich guy who uses essentially like a paltry portion of his money to create some building somewhere and say, this will be a beacon for Gotham City. And it never is, you know, and, th and then in turn, uh, he just runs around at night and just beats up criminals hoping they can change. And it's just kind of like, you know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. You know, sometimes hope just isn't enough. Doing things changes things. Doing nothing keeps things exactly the way they are. And that's kind of what Batman's done. And that's what he's saying in the story. Like he's looking at that and he's like, I'm ineffective. Like I'm not an effective superhero. It's kind of a cool thing here. Like it's, it's a, it's a cool explanation and it's a cool discussion that goes on. Now, what this means going forward is that it's kind of ushering Batman into a new direction. Because if Batman sits around and says, everything I've done to this point has been ineffective in making Gotham City a better place, right? Like the Joker's still there running around doing things. The Penguin's still doing things, Two-Face, Bane, so on and so forth. And in fact, Bane actually conquered the city. If all this is going on and I'm one step forward and two steps back, then like something has to change. And so the idea here, at least what I hope comes out of it, is that we see kind of a new era of Batman where either it's using his wealth to actually do something that matters as opposed to funding some building somewhere. Hopefully something big kind of comes out of that and hopefully it'll be kind of cool. But then what you also have kind of the tail end of this, and this is where it sort of continues on into Batman Superman number one, is you basically have Commissioner Gordon who's just sort of out there and he's met by a rookie and the guy's like, hey man, are you okay? And commission, we end up finding out Commissioner Gordon when he was pushed face down into the water by the Grim Knight was exposed to the toxin. He's going crazy. He's essentially becoming the Batman who laughs. It's kind of a cool little moment there because it's the idea that the legacy always lives on and the legacy always continues. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.